From 1899 to 1902, a war between farmers, commonly known as Boers and soldiers of the British Empire, waged over South Africa. The British, also known as Khakis, fought against the Boer snipers and militias. The Great British Empire needed three years to defeat an army that was smaller in size than the population of Brighton. To make matters even worse for the British, the initial phase of the war saw Boer militias claiming success after success, resulting in some serious doubt and embarrassment among the British. And, as always, timestamps are in the description, as this is a long one. Back in 1830, the Boers, originally farmers from Dutch origin, migrated to South Africa. They established two republics, the Orange Free State and Transvaal. Now, there is more to the history of the Boer, among which the Grote Trek, their migration northward when the British came around the corner. PC3 Productions made a very good video about the complete history of the 19th century of the Boer. Back in 1880, there had already been a war between the British and the Boer population. During this war, the British initially managed to capture large parts of Transvaal, though the Boers defeated them in 1881 at the Battle of Majuba, regaining their independence. During their independence in the lead-up to the outbreak of the Second Boer War, the respective presidents of both republics were Paul Kruger of Transvaal, and the other was Martina Stein of the Orange Free State. In 1886, with tensions ever so present, gold was discovered in Transvaal. The discovery of gold didn't just bring wealth to Transvaal, but a stream of outlanders, or foreigners as well. Over the years, tensions rose between the outlanders, mainly British, and Boer population in Transvaal. By 1895, the Boer population was nearly outnumbered by the outlanders. These outlanders had to pay higher taxes and weren't allowed to vote in elections. Paul Kruger, president of the Republic, wasn't planning on being voted out anytime soon. It was in late December 1895 the British embarked on what would become known as the Jameson Raid. A British militia under Leander Star Jameson invaded Transvaal in an attempt to have the outlanders rise up against the Boer. Well, this failed and in response Kruger started importing weapons because he felt the independence of Transvaal was under threat. A thought not too difficult to sympathize with, I'd say. During the next year, Sir Alfred Milner, the British governor of Cape Colony, started to increase the pressure on Transvaal in favor of the Outlanders. After all, they made up the majority of the population in Transvaal by this point. Kruger demanded Great Britain cede its claim to Transvaal. Over years, negotiations were embarked upon, but both parties refused to give in just a little. British troops had been gathering around the border of the Boer republics for a while, and then Kruger sent an ultimatum to Britain that expired on the 12th of October 1899 to withdraw their troops. As Britain rejected the ultimatum, the Boer launched their attacks on British positions, fully convinced if they didn't, they would be attacked in no time. As such, the Boers took up arms because they were convinced it was the only way they would be able to ensure their independence. The Brits pushed the Boers to extremes. They thought Afrikaner nationalism was a danger to the superior position of Great Britain in South Africa. Lord Milner saw Transvaal as the threat to the loyalty of the British citizens that lived in Cape Colony and Natal. Ever since the discovery of gold in Transvaal, the economical balance had shifted away from Cape Colony. All over South Africa, these British citizens had spread over the years, and it seemed like a logical consequence that, given there would be a short war, Transvaal would be taken over by the British as the newest territory to add to the British Empire. The Boers would easily be defeated, it was assumed. It was an incredibly complicated situation of two opposing interests on a clearly defined piece of territory, but the war was yet to come. From the military point of view, it is commonly accepted that the war consisted of three phases. The first phase lasted from the 12th of October to the end of the year. The Boers were definitely in a great position during this time. They invaded Natal and the Cape Colony, enticed uprisings, annexed British territory sieged the cities Mafeking, Kimberley and Ladysmith. Furthermore, during the second week of December, which the British would later refer to as the Black Week, the Boers defeated General William Gettaker at Stormberg, Lord Paul Methuen at Magersfontein, and General Redvers Buller, the British Commander-in-Chief, at Colenso. These Boer militias posed a bigger challenge to the mighty British Empire than anyone had expected. Strategically, the Boers were on the offensive, yet tactically, they were on the defensive.
They enjoyed the advantage of already formed border positions and they were experienced in constructing field defenses and trenches. It was how General Coast de la Rey won at Magersfontein. The trenches were ideally positioned. An interesting anecdote of de la Rey is that he was noted for his chivalry returning all prisoners of war taken after the battle of Magersfontein because he could not support them. He even returned the British General Methuen. Now, the Boer trenches were filled with snipers that were admittedly more skilled than the British. To give you an idea of the British perspective of this phase of the Boer War, the British Prime Minister Herbert Henry Asquith lamented about the lack of fantasy of their generals. After reading the reports of Buller, he said, Our generals appear to not just be unable to claim victory, but are also unable to explain why they are not. Furthermore, the first two weeks of the war, the British were outnumbered. There were barely 13,000 British soldiers in South Africa, and the majority of them were stuck in the big cities. The Boers, on the other hand, had over 30,000 men. So when during late October the British First Army Corps arrived, it seemed the war was going to be turned around. It was under the command of General Sir Redvers Buller, and his arrival was promising. He made one crucial mistake, however. He spread his forces and attempted to relieve both Ladysmith and Kimberley. By December, his troops were defeated on every battlefield. His reserves stationed around the border did not move up to relieve their counterparts in the chaos and seemingly curb the steamroll campaign by the Boer militias. On the 23rd of January, the Battle of Spionkop marked another British defeat. The Boers were heavily outnumbered by the British, yet managed to achieve victory. Spionkop was a strategically located hill in Natal. The Boers had occupied the hill upon which the British general, Charles Warren, decided to have it attacked from two sides by his British forces. Due to fog and miscommunication, the British dug themselves in at the bottom of the hill, with the Boer militias dug in much higher, firing away at the Brits. Unable to escape the Boer fire, the Battle of Spionkop marked a humiliating defeat for the British army. Now, as an interesting anecdote, Winston Churchill, the future Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, was present at the Battle of Spionkop, serving as a war correspondent of the newspaper Morning Post. Mahatma Gandhi was there as well, working as an auxiliary to the British Volunteer Ambulance Corps. Although the Boers had surprised everyone with their success, from this point onward, it would last for little, under a month. Because of their victories during the Black Week and the Spionkop, the Boers arrived at their peak of success. The Prussian military theorists and General Karl von Clausewitz referred to this as the culminating point of victory in his book Von Krieger. By this he meant that one side had achieved the maximum possible military advantage relative to the available resources and feasible political aims. Beyond that, as Clausewitz wrote, battlefield gains will become increasingly marginal relative to the costs and risks incurred, and if it presses too far, the attacking side risks major setbacks and even catastrophic defeat. Well, this is rather applicable to the position the Boers were in right now. Due to the catastrophic defeats the British suffered, Commander-in-Chief Buller was now replaced by Field Marshal Lord Frederick Roberts. Lord Horatio Kitchener became his Chief of Staff and Buller would remain in charge of Natal while Roberts started planning the relief attempt of Kimberley. It would mark the beginning of the war's second phase. Roberts acted with much imagination and Kitchener improvised a system that used transport wagons instead of the railway system that was up until then prone to Boer ambushes. Reason for this was the philosophy of Boer General Piet Conier. He was convinced about the fact that the British would never abandon the railways as they appeared a vital advantage in land. And, well, the British did abandon the railway tactic. Roberts made sure to establish a stable supply line for his troops and embarked on his first objective, relieving Kimberley. He surrounded the city and had Major General John French lead the assault. The climax came when the famed British cavalry charge relieved the city that had been besieged for 124 days. Cognier's Boer troops of around 4,000 men were ambushed at the valley of the Modder Rivier at Paardeberg and were forced to surrender on the 28th of February. Incidentally, this was on the 19th anniversary of the Boer victory at Majuba Hill during the First Boer War. At any rate, these initial British victories marked the turning point of the war. Cognier's surrender certainly had the morale of the Boers take a heavy blow. Those that had besieged Ladysmith now retreated and finally, after four attempts, Buller was able to relieve the city. 
Subsequently, Bloemfontein was occupied and the British rapidly pushed through. The entire Orange Free State was annexed. General Pretorius was pushed back towards the hills of the Basutoland Protectorate and was eventually forced to surrender, together with many other troops of the Free State. Roberts remained in Bloemfontein for around seven weeks due to a contagious epidemic that spread among his troops. Once that was dealt with, he started his march north and captured Johannesburg, Pretoria, and pushed the forces defending Transvaal eastward along the railway to Mozambique, then a Portuguese colony. By September 1900, Transvaal II was annexed. The second phase of the war, the massive British counter-offensive, was over. And with it, the war seemed to be over as well, with a Boer defeat the only logical result. So the Boers were driven out of Orange Free State and Transvaal, it seemed. A clear victory for the British, except it wasn't really. The third phase of the war lasted for another 18 months, the Boer insurgency. What happened during these months is often described as guerrilla warfare, but there are some objections to using that term, primarily the fact that guerrilla warfare tends to be waged by small groups of combatants that operated independently of each other. Well, the Boer militias had been defeated in open combat and the Boer governments left their capitals, they managed to retain their authority. President Paul Kruger, at this point an old and broken man, the war had taken a heavy toll on him, sailed to Europe. He would never return to his beloved country and eventually die in Switzerland. His mandate was transferred to Schalkburger, the vice president of the Transvaal, together with General Louis Botha, commander of the armed forces, Berger wasn't planning on giving up the fight anytime soon. General Botha commanded forces in eastern Transvaal and General de la Rey commanded troops in the west. Elsewhere, Boer militias took it matters into their own hands and sought combat on their own terms, attacking British supply lines using their flexible ways of open combat and knowledge of the territory. These proved very effective in opposing the British. Theoretically, both Transvaal and Orange Free State had been annexed. President of the Orange Free State, Martinus Stein, had left his republic as well, and the government seat was wherever he happened to reside. In practice, however, the Boers waged a war of attrition against the British resisting a much larger force. Now, this third phase of the conflict changed the nature of it. The Boers became convinced the British were trying to eradicate them as a nation, while the British found themselves in ever-increasing difficulty differentiating between civilians and soldiers. This new pattern became apparent first in Orange Free State, after the British annexation it had been renamed as Orange River Colony. A large part of the population had surrendered and was allowed to return home after swearing an oath of neutrality. Neither President Stein nor Acting President Berger recognized the annexation, nor the right of their own people to withdraw from their struggle. The British barely offered protection to those Boers that surrendered. Those that had surrendered were now threatened by Boer militias to be executed as deserters. In turn, Roberts started torching farms of Boers that broke their oath and took up arms against the British again, resulting in reprisals from the Boers again. It was rather chaotic, to put it mildly. The British started building concentration camps under military control where those that had surrendered could, together with their family, seek protection. These concentration camps saw inhumane and abhorrent conditions. We'll get back to them in a bit. As the third phase of the war dragged on, several realities appeared. One was a military stalemate, another was the fact there were split opinions on both sides about how to continue the conflict. Furthermore, there was confusion among those that had to act out orders and increased friction between civilian and military authorities. Well, for the Boers, their military and civilian authorities had become intertwined because of the war, so separating them became near impossible. The British had a mandate to do whatever was necessary for the objective of winning the war, though often civilians disagreed with the methods used. One thing the parties had in common was their determination to keep on fighting until the bitter end. Milner's goal was breaking Boer nationalism. During 1900, he demanded an unconditional surrender from the Boers. Lord Kitchener had unsuccessfully proposed peace conditions to General Botha in Middelburg. It didn't seem like the Boers were going to surrender. As such, in 1901, the two Boer governments came together in Baterville and agreed neither would sign a separate peace unless annexations were returned by Britain. Given these conditions, the war could continue until the last Boer had either been killed or captured. 
Roberts laid down his command in late 1900 and was replaced by Kitchener. And Kitchener, well, he had personal reasons to want to end this war as soon as possible. He wanted to become the commander-in-chief of the armed forces in British India and feared he would be passed if he was still tangled up in this war. And as such, Kitchener barely cared about the political impact of his actions and his respect for Milner soon changed to indifference. As for Milner, he started to distrust Kitchener as time went on. The British army seemed to have lost the initiative during military operations. Suddenly, it was responding to Boer actions in countless places instead of the other way around. Boer general Christian de Wet undertook two spectacular robberies during this time. From a military point of view, the Vets' actions didn't mean that much, but they certainly showed the incompetence and ineptness of the British. While the British had a strong position in military terms, they definitely needed to change the situation behind the scenes in order for a victory. So, I've given a bit of an overview of the political situation of the Boer War during its third phase. Fact of the matter is that it was marked by Boer insurgency, showcasing multiple attacks on the British. During one noteworthy event during early 1901, the Free State Generals Peter Kritzinger and James Herzog attacked the Cape Colony for the second time and managed to invade. They had tried this once before, but this time they sparked an uprising that was much more serious than the first one. It resulted in many casualties, executions on both sides and admittedly questionable practices against civilians. Eventually, the British regained control over the territory. Later, joining survivors of the Kritzinger troops, the former Transvaal state attorney Jan Christian Smuts led a spectacular raid towards the same direction. He ended up in the northwest of the colony. By the end of 1901, throughout the entirety of the Cape Colony, a state of siege was declared. The British, by this point, had nearly 250,000 troops on the ground, while the Boers never had more than 30,000. The Brits were at a disadvantage as they were spread over the entire colony. Although impressive fighting took place and brutal repercussions were enacted upon by both sides, in general the situation in Cape Colony remains a stalemate. As the British faced strong Boer resistance attacks and they seemingly couldn't get a grip on it, Kitchener now resorted to the tactic that became known as a scorched earth tactic. Kitchener started commanding large hunts on Boer militias, building forth on Robert's tactic, burning down farms along the way. British troops now raised over the countryside, confiscating cows and sheep, burning crops, farms and yards. Furthermore, a collection of cabins between barbed wire obstructions were erected. All over Boer terrain, these buildings disappeared, occasionally alternated with trenches or bunkers. These buildings made the resupplying of Boer militias and movement of said militias even more difficult. Even though Kitchener's method was horrible for the land which now technically belonged to the British Empire, he figured if he stuck with it, it would eventually guarantee him victory. The Boer families that were chased away could only reside in the British concentration camps, where the situation became more abysmal by the day. It is worth dedicating a small chapter to these camps. In 1901, the British internment camps were pestered by disease, lung infections, measles and stomach typhoid. Thousands of Boer civilians got sick and passed away. These horrors bestowed upon the Boer population were the result of negligence and simply the lack of control and medical knowledge. I don't wish to sugarcoat any of it, the conditions were horrible. At any rate, over 20,000 Boer citizens died in those camps. The journalist Emily Hobhaus visited these camps and published about them in newspapers, bringing its horrible conditions to the attention of the British public. Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, who was the head of British opposition, referred to the conditions as barbaric. Lord Milner happened to have used the same expression before when discussing the matter with the Minister of Colonies, Joseph Chamberlain. All in all, I believe the images you're seeing right now allows for entertaining the thought of the conditions. Mortality rates due to disease, the destruction of farms and lands, the annexation of territory and the war itself were fruitful ground for even more hatred against the British. Well, Lord Kitchener added another reason for hatred, field executions. Field executions could be carried out for insurrection, but for the murder of non-whites as well. Kitchener recruited around 10,000 non-white soldiers who, if killed by the Boers, provided the reason for the British to execute Boer soldiers. In turn, Boer militants torched public buildings. The death penalty was carried out for those torchings as well. 
and as such many Boer soldiers would be executed. Two prominent examples are Gideon Schepers and Commandant Lotter, whose commando was holding itself up in Cape Colony after Kirtzinger's invasion. He was tracked down by the British and all men were executed. Lord Milner was powerless against all these events, and by 1901 he had entered Transvaal in order to place its industrial territory under government surveillance. After all, one of the reasons for these hostilities were the gold mines in Transvaal. Slowly but surely the mines started operating again and the rebuild commenced. Nevertheless, Milner was convinced negotiating with the Boers was out of the question. The republics had to disappear. The conflict with Lord Kitchener didn't appear as Kitchener still eagerly wanted to go to be assigned to British India and wanted to commence peace negotiations whenever the opportunity presented itself. As the British were ruthlessly pursuing Boer militias with thousands of Boer civilian casualties as a result, both sides started to show serious signs of doubt. For the British, the re-election was a problem and the conflict started to have a very bad aftertaste. But among the Boer population there wasn't a united front anymore either. The Orange Free State Boer generally was still clinging onto their initial demands. No surrender, unless complete independence, is guaranteed. Those from Transvaal were starting to realize its ideal probably would not be feasible. The Free State faced near total annihilation by this point. Its infrastructure burned down, its population was locked away in camps, yet its population remained Dutch. Transvaal, however, slowly started to resemble a British colony. Some men of Transvaal figured they now could still negotiate some concessions, with the alternative of resisting, resulting in the eradication of their entire language, the exile of its leaders, and the end of being Afrikaner. Thanks to the interference of the Dutch government, the British seemed open to negotiations with the Boer. Those from Transvaal seemed willing to do so, while those from the Orange Free State wanted to fight until the bitter end. Eventually, the peace negotiations were undertaken anyway. When these negotiations commenced, the Boer population first held a meeting in Klerksdorp among themselves, then between representatives of the Boers and Milner and Kitchener in Pretoria. Some other negotiations between different parties occurred over the weeks, and eventually an interesting political contrast started to show. President Stein and the representatives of the Free State thought similar to Milner. They wanted to continue the war because they firmly clung to their demands. Those from Transvaal and Kitchener had an overlapping, contrasting vision because they wanted the war to be over. Eventually the latter camp seemed to have the majority. In May 1902, the Treaty of Vereniging was signed, a treaty that did not seem like an unconditional surrender. It was an agreement that was established by negotiations which promised the Boer population self-government. The native population of South Africa would be deprived of political rights and the Dutch language would be allowed in schools and law courts. In turn, all the Boers had to swear an allegiance to the crown. It seemed like a decent agreement after a bitter war, and most of all, the Boer could claim they weren't defeated in battle. The spirit of nationalism among them was alive and well. And that is how the Second Boer War ended, an interesting and very complex conflict that overshadowed another interesting conflict on the other side of the world, China's Boxer Rebellion. I have made a video about that a while back, documenting it, and it's a fascinating and complex event in itself. Consider checking that out if that sounds interesting. And if you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing to my channel and checking me out on Patreon. Thank you for watching this video, and is there a person or event from South African history that you would like to know more about and perhaps see a video of? Let me know your thoughts in a comment. See you next time.